Our lesson tonight will have a basis in Acts chapter 9. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, for the next uh, four weeks, we're going to be looking in the book of Acts at some things that uh, have to do with Paul's ministry. And I hope that it will help us and strengthen us. The question that we raise tonight that we begin to look at in this new series, Submit to Fear or Dare to be Bold, uh, is this. Do you fear change or boldly face it? Do you fear change or boldly face it? This series is designed to help us focus on how much we submit to fear in our lives rather than being very bold to face the challenges that we encounter and trust God as we do it, really believing that his power will sustain us and help us uh, do what we need to do for him. In the way of an example to lead us off, let me ask you this question and uh, the, you know, you don't have to respond verbally uh, unless one or two of you want to, but the question would be this, would you submit to fear or would you accept a challenge to ride the tallest roller coaster that they have down at Carowinds? I'd submit to fear. <laughs> you, you'd submit to fear? <laughs> uh, so you wouldn't accept a dare to get on board then, right? I'm not going to do it. Well, neither would I. <laughs> uh, not because I don't believe the Lord would provide for me, but... Uh, uh, you know, those rides are designed to incite fearlessness, aren't they? Uh, the last time we were down there, we had a church group with us and several of the folks were saying, Pastor, come on, get on this thing. I said, no way. They said, oh, what's the matter with you? Get on this thing. I said, listen, let me tell you. And I'm not being mean or anything. I said, I am not getting on that thing. I know better than to get on that thing. Uh, so... <laughs> Uh, I just don't submit, uh, I submit to the fear and I don't accept the dare uh, to get on something like that. <clears throat> well, reflecting on that kind of experience can lead us into thinking about issues of fear that we have in our lives and uh, think about trust that we need to have as we deal with those things that come on a regular basis, things like, for example, fear related to change, which is what this lesson is about tonight, or fear related to speaking up and standing up for what is right, overcoming that kind of fear. We all have faced it and probably will face it again out there in the future. Fear related to the uncertainties of tomorrow and beyond. I don't know what's out there. There's a lot of things that give me reason for concern. And I'm sure you're the same way. Whenever I watch the newscast as I, uh, as I do uh, on a very limited basis, I try not to give too much of my time to that because it can hook you, you know, and become uh, a, a bit addictive so I try to manage that, stay aware of the things that are taking place. But uh, as I look out there in the future, there's a lot of things that give me great concern. I'm not saying that I am fearful of the future because I do believe this one thing. Uh, I know who holds the future and I know that I'm in his hands and I know that he will provide. In the midst of these fears, along with others that you might add to those that I have just mentioned, you may feel that your life sometimes, and, and maybe all of us feel at times, that our life is like a roller coaster. 
it's uh, up and then it's down and it's sideways and we go through twists and we go through turns and we wonder what in the world does God have in mind? Uh, why is he working in our lives the way he is working? You may find yourself or any of us could find ourselves thinking that we're headed into a dark tunnel that we just don't see any way through. We don't think we'll ever be able to come out on the other side. Uh, we just need to keep our faith strong in the Lord. So regardless of what our situations might be together, I think we can learn some valuable lessons by uh, examining some of the experiences that Saul had, who later became known as the Apostle Paul. What a great, great servant of the Lord he was and what a great example he is for us to look at. So let's... Uh, Let's begin to think about him tonight. And the lesson question that I raise for you uh, to think about is simply this. Do you submit to the fear of change or bravely accept every challenge to change and embrace it and go forward with it? As you ponder that question, I want you to think about some additional questions and some action statements that, that I'll give you right quick. Number one, another question, what is your attitude generally toward change? Now, <clears throat> people answer that question in different ways. Uh, Generally speaking, out of a great multitude of people, if confronted with that question, their response would be, I don't like it. And most of us would probably say, I don't like change. I like things to be pretty consistent, pretty straightforward. Some people fear change. Some people embrace it and they go forward with it. Secondly, I want you to think about and you don't have to say anything openly about this. I will comment about it, but think about an experience you have had with change in your life. Was there a benefit? Was there fear up front? Once that fear was overcome and there was a bold embracement of making the change, did growth occur? Was there experiences that led to convincing you that making the change was the right thing for you at that particular time? I remember um, back in 1985 when I was first confronted with uh, making a major change for the family and me, which involved moving from this area where we were so familiar with and where I had grown up, Rosalie had grown up, and where our children had grown up in up to that point where they were in school. They were about, I don't know, uh, Cheryl was about 10, Cynthia was about 13 at that point when Duke confronted me and said, we have an opportunity for you and we want to move you and your family to Bessemer City, North Carolina. And boy, that was a major change. And I did a lot of soul searching and a lot of praying and sought counsel and uh, with folks that I had a lot of confidence in, sought counsel with my dad who was living at that time and all the counsel was good, very helpful, very beneficial. We ultimately made the change, even though we had a lot of fear initially about doing it. And I remember the day that Rosalie and I went down there for uh, doing a little bit of investigating about where we might live and so forth. And I remember her looking at me 
as we were there in the front seat of the car and we pulled up to a stop sign and she looked over at me and she said, honey, please don't bring me to this place. <laughs> That'll work on you. That'll work on you. And boy, it began to work on me. And it increased my fear. Uh, but was I going to be brave and take the change? Uh, I remember going over and talking with dad and dad said, son, you know, when you work for these companies and you want to progress with them and they see an opportunity for you and they want to move you, then generally speaking, you 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 are kind of in a situation where if you want to grow with them, you need to think about this. He was positive about it. I appreciate what he had to say. Did everything work out? We were there for five years. Everything worked very well. To God be the glory. I look back on that experience. It was a growing experience for all of us. I'm talking about Rosalie, Cynthia, and Cheryl, and myself. And we became a part of a community that, uh, much like you folks have done here at Benham, they adopted us uh, from day one. And when the announcement was made that they that Duke was moving us to Fort Mill, South Carolina, in 1990, one of the sweet ladies that loved us so much there in town wrote an article to the editor of the paper. Uh, for all the reasons why the Southerners didn't need to be taken away from Bessemer City. <laughs> and it was a good letter. <laughs> but they didn't want to see us go. They didn't want to see us go. And we look back and we think of the lives that we touched. The uh, ministry that I had there, not only the work situation, but the ministry. But boy, what a change that was to leave our family here, and all of our friends that we had, the stable situation that we had of being in our home that we had built, and we'd just been there for four years in the home, then we just had to uproot and go. Uh, we did so as bravely as we knew how, um, even though we had a lot of fear, we embraced the change and we went forward. These things that we talk about are challenging for most of us. A couple of more questions. Let me get very, uh, very much to the heart of where we want to go tonight. Are you willing to be open-minded and allow the Holy Spirit to help you Recognize changes God might want you to make in your life. Now, only you can answer that question. Second question is, would you submit to fear or boldly strive to bring into being whatever changes it is that God wants you to make in your life? Rosalie and I, I truly believe grew through that experience and we grew through subsequent experiences when we were offered other opportunities to move and we did so and in each situation the change as great as it was brought about growth and so I look at change a bit differently than what a lot of people look at it particularly folks who have never experienced any major change some people and there's nothing wrong with this, but some people uh, still live right where they grew up, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that, but many of us have gone around the twists and turns of life, and, and we've had a lot of change, and we've had to, to do that by boldly looking to the Lord and trusting Him. So as you look to the future, do you fear change or are you willing to 
really bravely embrace it, boldly embrace it, whatever it might involve, because I think change is something that we will always have. It will always be with us. It might be small in substance, but I think it will always be with us and we'll be subject to encountering it. Let's look at the scripture, Acts chapter 9. I'm going to read down through the first part of verse 19. And you're familiar with this. It's the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of them letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were open, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel, and I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house, and putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, hath appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mayest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. We'll conclude our reading right, right there. Did you capture as I was reading that anything having to do with change or changes? I hope you saw several changes. I hope you identified them and said, wonder if he's going to talk about that. wonder if he's going to talk about that. Because there's a lot of change in those 18 verses plus the first part of uh, 19. There's a lot of nuggets that we could discover here and uncover in our study of or review of this. But we'll not get them all. Let me just hasten to give you some. Because as we look at this, I do believe that it can show us that when God is involved, we have every reason to embrace change and not be afraid of it. In the way of a general background for this, the book of Acts links the story of Jesus given in the Gospels to the story of the church, which is found in the rest of the New Testament writings that we have, that we read. It covers a period, that is the book of Acts, covers a period of transition giving an account of the roles of Peter and Paul in spreading Christianity to the Jews and to the Gentiles. 
I often caution people, and I may have done this before in the past, but do not use the book of Acts to develop doctoring out of because it is a book of transition. We need to understand it to be a book of transition. A lot of wonderful things, of wonderful nuggets for us to pick up as we study the book of Acts, but it's not a book designed to give us doctrinal truth like the books that Paul wrote to the churches, the letters that he wrote to the churches and so forth, where doctrinal truth is established. So we have to be careful about that. What may we discover then from the experiences of, of Saul here? Well, verses 1 and 2 tell me that initially Saul was going in the wrong direction. He was doing so, however, with a lot of zeal. He was zealous. He was a zealous Pharisee and a defender of God's law, just like he said he was in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14. He thought he was doing what was right. You remember Sunday I made mention of Proverbs, where on two occasions Proverbs says, there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Saul thought he was on the right road and he was doing the right things, but he was on the wrong path, the wrong path going in the wrong direction. He willingly murdered those who disagreed with his beliefs and his actions moved him further and further from God rather than closer to God. But in the situation that he was in, he did not realize that he was being moved from God. He didn't realize that he needed to have a change. But God did. God knew he needed to have a change. So God intervened in verses 4 through 9 and inter initiated the process that brought about this tremendous change that took place in the life of Saul. He was confronted there on the road to Damascus with the truth about God's Son. Notice his question in the Lord's response when he said unto him, the Lord said unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? Tell me who you are. And the Lord told him who he was. So he was confronted at, about the truth of God's Son. And his conversion there ultimately brought about a change in his name. That was something else that was significant in his life. His direction was changed. His name was changed. The Bible doesn't say specifically that God changed the name of Saul. There are occasions in which the Bible is very specific and tells us that God did change a name. Like for example, we know that God changed Abram's name to Abraham and we know that God changed Jacob's name to Israel. God made those changes. However, we simply note from Acts 13, 9, that Saul, in the process of time, very early after his conversion, became known as Paul. And if you're interested in why that change took place, might I suggest unto you that Paul is the Greek form of the Hebrew name Saul. So Hebrew is the Old Testament, Greek is the New Testament, right? So God was fulfilling his plan here to transform the name that Saul had to that of Paul so that he would be able to reach the Gentiles because that was a better name for him to use to do that. Thus his name became Paul, as we read about, as I've already told you in Acts 13 verse 9. The third thing that I share with you is that Saul's past reputation caused fear to arise in the heart of Ananias when God asked him to meet with, with Saul. 
We noted that in verses 10 through 14. Ananias shares his concern with the Lord. Saul was known as one of the church's greatest enemies, an arch rival of Christians at that particular time. Now, I think a question is in order for us to consider. Can we rightly criticize Ananias because he was afraid? Uh, after all, what would we have done? What would we do if we were in the same situation? Um, if God's really spoke to our heart and said, you know, here's what I want you to do. And we knew that the individual that he was directing us to was one of the most violent individuals in the world, known to be in the world. And Saul was known to be vicious. Uh, in, in his dealings with the Christians and so forth. Ananias was like most of us. Are we not guilty of sometimes judging a person for what they have been rather than what they might become in Christ? So God spoke to, the Lord spoke to the heart of Ananias and, and the Lord changed the attitude of Ananias just as he changed the attitude of Saul. So there's two changes that we know of that we can note here in this passage of Scripture. You see, God informed Ananias that Paul, or who became Paul, Saul at that time, was a chosen vessel to preach the gospel to the Gentiles. And just as Paul trusted the Lord, or Saul, so did Ananias have to trust the Lord. And thankfully, he did just that. So as we head toward concluding this lesson with a whole lot of loose ends out there and other things that you could think about, let me just kind of summarize where I'm at with this. And I'll try to do this in each of the upcoming lessons. Here's what I want you to realize in the reading of this passage and in me talking about Saul's direction being changed, his life being changed, his attitude being changed, the attitude of Ananias being changed. He became willing to go meet with Saul, even though initially he had this fear, but he became brave through the power of God to go and meet with, with Saul. We note, or we can conclude that the things that Saul feared before God changed him became attributes to his ministry. And sometimes the things that you and I fear in our lives can be attributes to our future way of living for him. I think that's what happened to Rosalie and me and our family. The fear that we had of certain things, those things became attributes in our lives that have enabled us to minister to people that we never would have ever believed that we would have had the privilege to minister to. I would have never believed that doors would have been open for me to minister in and through the ways that the Lord has opened doors for me to minister because of accepting the changes that came while trusting the Lord to provide in the midst of me making them. You see, Saul, the Pharisee, was concerned about keeping the law. And that's why he was operating the way that he did against the Christians, the people of the church. But it was changed by the Lord on the road to Damascus so that he became the greatest communicator ever known of how the Lord Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. You see, knowing the law like he did, being of the Sanhedrin, well-versed in the law, understanding everything that the law demanded, and seeking to fulfill all of the requirements of the law before his experience on the road to Damascus, 
afterward, all that knowledge became beneficial to him because the Lord could use him to share the message to the Gentiles that Jesus fulfilled the law and salvation was not by the law, but it was by grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. His knowledge became an attribute to him. And later he shares with the church at Philippi, I won't turn and read it, but you can do so in Philippians chapter three, particularly verses five through eight, the change that God made in him, and boy, was it a tremendous change. Ananias, the second guy that we're looking at by way of example in this passage, changed his attitude as God worked in his heart towards Saul. He feared him as being a persecutor of believers, but when God spoke to his heart and said, you need to understand that this is a chosen vessel to me to carry the message to the Gentiles. That changed Ananias and he helped Saul with learning the very basics of fundamental truth to know how to begin the ministry that God had called him to. As I close, think about these things that I give you real quickly. Number one, we as a church, I submit unto you, need to express the right attitude toward change as it is directed by the Holy Spirit. We cannot remain the same always. We need to be willing and open-minded to accept change directed by the Holy Spirit. Pastor, what does that look like? I certainly cannot tell you tonight. I don't know what that looks like. I don't know all of what the Lord has for us in, in the future out there. But whatever it is, if it's directed by the Holy Spirit, we need to be willing to follow and embrace it, even though we may fear it initially. Number two, we as a church need to express the right attitude toward those that God changes as He brings people into our midst. Maybe we know their background. Maybe we know what they have done in the past. But we need to look at them as they are brought to us in the light of what they can become through investing time wisely in them to grow in the Lord Jesus Christ after they meet Him and He becomes their Savior. Number three, we should pray and pray earnestly, Lord, give me victory over my fear and lead me to change my heart to more perfectly honor You with my life. Number four, I think we need to pray for God to help us look at what a person can become through Christ rather than judge them for what they have been, just as I was saying a few minutes ago. And it's very, very easy for us to fall into the trap of doing the wrong thing there. Finally, when God is changing us as well as changing the people around us, there is no reason, my beloved friends, to have fear. We have every reason to trust God and to embrace the changes that He is making that are directed by the Holy Spirit and directed by His Word in our lives and in our midst, in our church family, in our neighborhood, and so forth. I hope that that offers you some encouraging things to think about. And I know I didn't do justice to all of what we could have covered in this short period of time. But Father, we thank you that we've been able to be together. We thank you for the challenge that you impart to our hearts. I certainly thank you for the challenge that you have imparted to me with regard to this lesson. And I thank you for how you have challenged me in the past to overcome the fear that I had of making changes that you were leading us to make, but I just was not aware of it initially. When I became aware of it, my heart was filled with fear. I pray that you will forgive me for having that fear, but I'm grateful that you enable me to boldly embrace the changes and you enabled Rosalie to join me in doing so. 
and our family to do so. And thank you for the journey that you have led us on to date because we were, re we were willing to do our very best to make the changes that you called upon us to make at the time that you called upon us to make a change. I pray for your continuing leadership in all of our hearts and lives. In Jesus' name, amen.